Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this is Patch In, the show from Sound Notion where we explore the wonderful world of electroacoustic music every month on a somewhat sporadic basis. So let's start with some news. Um, NAM is over. A ton of products have been announced, and they are, by and large, awesome. Uh, so there are two new products from Moog uh, that are very interesting. One is the Sub-37 Oscillator. Uh, sorry, Oscillator. Synthesizer. Well, it uses oscillators. But more to the point, all of the oscillators and every feature on it can be controlled remotely via MIDI, which is really cool. Uh, literally every knob, every slider can be tweaked. But even cooler than that, potentially, is the new Moog Theremini, uh, which I have pre-ordered. It is a Moog Etherwave Theremin that has MIDI output, assistive pitch correction so that you can gliss everything or you can get an actual scale. And on top of having the standard heterodyning oscillators that you find in every theremin, it uses those either independently or to control preset sounds from the Animoog iPad app. It's $300 at your favorite music store. Uh, they don't ship until either the last week of April or the first week of May, though. There's a new synthesizer coming out. It's uh, in the works from Korg. They'll, so what they're going to do is uh, take up the torch from the old ARP Odyssey. Mm -hmm. um, originally produced in 1972, Korg is going to redevelop and reissue this as instrument, and it's going to... For all the old analog synth geeks, this should be a really nice thing to have back on the market. Yeah, the ARP was actually one of the first synthesizers I ever learned how to use uh, synthesis techniques on, so nice. I'm pretty excited for that, but it will probably be outside of my price range. So. <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, well. Um, other things, uh, Mick DSP, who makes some of the best uh, plugins for Pro Tools for things like compression and cleaning up your audio, filtering, all of that, has released a set of their plugins for Reason in the Rack Extension program. Uh, they are competitively priced, nowhere near as expensive as the Pro Tools plugins, and they just integrate directly into your rack in Reason as if they were a standard part of the program. Additionally, um, so Roland is... Uh, I seems like they might be available in May, but Roland has a whole new system or a collection of synthesizers that they're putting out under the IRA group, <laughs> I guess is what they're called. And I keep calling it area or yeah. And, and, uh, but anyway, what they have, it's going to be a synthesizer, um, the system one, they've got a, a voice controller, um, and a drum machine and a bass synth. So like the, the classic things that you're expecting from Roland, like a good, analog synth, a drum machine, a bass synth, and then uh, they've been doing different things with vocal processing for a while, and this one is going to be a nice little thing. It's like this big, <laughs> it's got a mic in, and it lets you do all kinds of things with um, pitch correction, vocoding, and other kinds of voice modulation. I'm particularly excited to see that one when it comes out. Yeah, and if you haven't seen the YouTube demo of this already, go on there and watch it. Uh, it really does sound like vintage Roland 808 for the drum machine. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Um, as far as software goes, uh, Cakewalk has released a port of their Zeta synthesizer for iPad. Uh, you can, in fact, use that as if you were just using it on the computer. And supposedly, although I haven't tested this yet since I don't have a copy of it, uh, the patches from the computer can be transferred over to the iPad. Uh, the Zeta, of course, is really famous because it was used in the score for the Dark Knight movies. Uh, they did a special Batman edition of it. Uh, it's got some really cool sounds, so that should be something to check out. And if you are an Ableton user and a Max for Live user, and let's face it, if you're an Ableton user, you should be, uh, you would be happy to know that there is the Dark Synth, a uh, Max MSP plugin for Ableton, that is an additive synth. And it gives you a boatload of oscillators and you can just add waves together, very similar to the old Yamaha DX7 without the massive, massive hardware. So on, the, on the digital audio workstation front, or DAW as people call it, um, there's a, a new announcement from NAM 2014, the Bitwit 
Bitwig Studio is going to be released on March 26th for a, a measly $3.99. Um, I'm pretty excited about this. It's going to be like an Ableton Live alternative kind of thing, but it's got... Uh, they're really doing some work making it um, so that multiple users can use it at the same time, building in some modular synth kind of things, a little bit of programming stuff, and it looks pretty exciting. Additionally, it's going to be Windows, Mac, and Linux, which should be an interesting thing. So for all of you Linux users, this might be a really interesting thing to check out. Does right. Ableton work on Linux? Unfortunately, it does not. Uh, if it did, I would be able to get rid of almost everything I have that's Windows based. And that's the thing, right? <laughs> so the Linux based, like pro audio stuff, I haven't seen very much of that at all, which is something that makes this pretty noteworthy. This yeah. Development. I mean, there are a couple of uh, programs for Linux for pro audio um, Ardor, of course, and Pure Data is set to run natively in Linux. Right. Uh, as it's ported to Mac and Windows. Um, but speaking of software, uh, there was one thing that came out this week that is causing a little bit of uh, a wave. Avid, makers of Pro Tools and uh, Sibelius, have been delisted from the NASDAQ exchange. They are considered to be a terrible, terrible investment uh, <laughs> by NASDAQ. So... We have yet to see what repercussions this will have. If uh, everyone's favorite DAW will be uh, being shipped over to a Hungarian coding farm, similar to a certain notation program, or if they're going to keep in-house development in the U.S., or if they, uh, by decoupling Pro Tools from the hardware, they've kind of dug their own grave. So we'll just have to watch and see. Hopefully they'll stick around for a while, though. I have... Way too many Pro Tools sessions that uh, I don't want to have to port over into other things. <laughs> so, Ben, I heard you got an exciting thing in the mail earlier uh, this week as well. Uh, Designing Sound, a book by Andy Farnell. Have I you did. Have it out much yet? Um, I have gone through quite a bit. Uh, there are four parts. So there's kind of uh, you know the theory and technique of electronic music condensed from 900 pages into about 60 uh, there's basic tutorials on how to use pure data and basic techniques for sound design before moving into the practicals. Yeah. So I kind of blazed through the first uh, two, three hundred pages, and I'm now onto the practicals, which is the second half of the book. Cool. Um, it's a really interesting book. If you can get through the first, or even if you skip the first section, which is very physics heavy, a lot of math, uh, then you get into practicals. It's a wonderful wonderful uh, introduction to pure data that will teach you how to code in a max related language so that then you could of course jump over to max or into uh, open max or jmax or whatever other version you decide to use mm -hmm. um, also it's got some really fun projects i've played around with a couple um, it starts out very simple doing things like phone tones and then goes all the way through how to do simulated wind and fire and ends with uh, things like the Starport transporter sound and R2-D2 style computer babbling. It's a really neat book. Yeah, really breaking down audio and using, using a programming language that's free as a, as a means to uh, learn how to build these things yourself. It's a pretty cool thing. I really like the format of the book. Yeah, that said, there are a couple of things that uh, do kind of become issues. Um, one thing I wish that would happen would be that he would tell you exactly the dimensions of the tables and arrays that he's using in the examples. Sure. So if you download the examples, everything works occasionally. If you're building them yourself, you get some very interesting artifacts that uh, can be cool in their own right. Interesting. Well, cool. Well, I think that about does it for our news this week. I'd like to introduce our guest for this month, Dr. Chet Udell. Um, thanks so much for joining us. He teaches uh, uh, at Music Technology and Intermedia at the University of Oregon. He composes music for both electroacoustic and acoustic mediums and cre is creating new wireless gestural control interfaces using MEMS technology or MEMS and uh, designing autonomous robotic musical agents and all kinds of things. But thanks so much for joining us, Chet. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, joining you guys. <laughs> Yeah, so um, 
I, I believe Ben made the contact of, uh, and I'm so glad that you're able to join us on this. But um, we've I've been hearing a lot about your new Kickstarter campaign for uh, the e-motion technology that you're putting together. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, let's sure. kick off with the Kickstarter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, um, this is a really exciting time for us. Uh, we've designed a uh, system called the Emersion System. And essentially, it's a, an array of tiny little wireless devices. Um, they're about this size, no larger than a couple quarters, really. And you can, uh, they all sense different things. Uh, some sense orientation, others sense pressure, others sense uh, light, uh, vibration, bending. And basically, you're free to attach these onto your instrument or body or uh, onto your workstation or walls or environments and uh, very quickly begin working with wireless sensing uh, in your music. And, and uh, uh, all of these sensors communicate with uh, uh, almost just about any software or hardware uh, you're using. Uh, I defy someone to show me something I can't use e the immersion system with. <laughs> uh, we've even had people uh, using this with analog, controlling analog synthesizers uh, using yeah. the, the CV uh, converters. Um, and uh, I, it works out of the box with uh, MIDI, uh, open sound control, uh, DMX lighting protocol. We have a special DMX module. And we have something we call the Emotion Switchblade, which uh, essentially emulates keyboard and mouse strokes on your Mac or PC. So you can pretty much control uh, things Things like video games, uh, PowerPoint. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, my wife is uh, going to be using this for um, uh, field research and um, as uh, 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 um, subjects are moving around in the environment, it's going to uh, input data live into an Excel spreadsheet. So, I mean, it's just really <laughs> kind of a powerful uh, tool. It's essentially a controller that uh, augments your musical capacities uh, to uh, very naturally translate your performance gestures uh, into controller data that uh, you then use our software client to map uh, onto your own musical software or hardware. Nice. So um, we, we've got on the video podcast, for those of you that are watching right now, that was just a clip of using uh, this emotion technology through a CV, like a control voltage to access an analog synth. Yeah. Yeah. This, I'm, I'm really interested in some of the technical things. And that's part of what we try to do in this show is really sure. dig into some of the details. Um, so yeah. we've got controlling computers, uh, controlling software through uh, <laughs> mouse and keyboard, uh, mm -hmm. virtual sure. events and stuff. I, mm -hmm. Maybe could you talk a little bit about that? Like, um, I've, I've, <laughs> it's funny The Dave who is switching the show, I, uh, he uses a little program that I wrote in processing a Java based application. Um, it uses a uh, virtual machine or uh, <laughs> I guess in Java, they call it a little robot to, um, to generate those events. Do you do something similar with this or is that, um, it's essentially, uh, for, for those the Max, Max MSP folks out there, there are these AKA objects, um, okay. and uh, right. there's there's uh, some objects that emulate the keyboard and mouse commands, and so or keyboards and mouse states. So, nice. uh, what I've done is, um, uh, I don't think you guys have a screenshot of the software, um, but basically, uh, you guys are familiar with DAWs, DAWs, like Pro mm -hmm. Tools, Logic, oh, yeah. GarageBand. And uh, I created this beautiful software that basically most electronic musicians, I hope, are familiar with uh, based on this DAW uh, architecture where you create tracks and then you can select uh, what sensor input you, you uh, have on your system. And then just like an audio track, you can process it. So you can um, filter the streams, you can invert it, you can do threshold detection, beat tracking, um, uh, basically... Uh, I, I was trying to think of anything you would want to do to, to process the data. I'm also adding in for uh, a version, maybe for a year down the road. It's currently in beta and working, uh, but cool. gesture recognition as well. So, you nice. know, maybe you don't want to just like do that, you know, the simple tilt. Maybe you want it to recognize when you do, you know, a shaking motion. 
And then, yeah. you know, uh, that particular shaking motion uh, will trigger an event. And it also tells you, like, how fast or slow you performed that motion as well. Um, yeah. So there's, uh, there's a lot of ramifications for this. But anyways, going back to the digital, uh, digital data workstation, um, so you have track inputs, you select what sensor you want, you process it, and then you send it out, uh, the output, which basically uh, can be run uh, in Max MSP, uh, output via MIDI, Open Sound Control, uh, DMX, the you know the Switchblade. Um, uh, so it's just um, a very uh, as far as using sensing and especially wireless sensing in projects. Um, this is a very plug and play system. This is about as plug and play as it gets, and um, uh, you're you're able to expand the system. Uh, you okay. can use you can um, plug in more sensors to it. <laughs> Yeah, or or not, not plug in, but rather just turn them on and let the wireless <laughs> frames, you know, synchronize. So what I like to do is I like to call this. Um, it, it's a it's a term, and I've Google searched it, and I think it's a new way to use this uh, called swarm sensing. And uh, swarm sensing is sort of based on my experience with sw uh, swarm robotics, where you have a bunch of robots and they all do that work together to perform a certain task, like find find a lost swimmer or something. Mm -hmm. um, well, in swarm sensing, basically you can think of each sensor on the network like an ant, and each ant has a particular job. Uh, and, you know, one might sense orientation of an object, another is going to sense pressure, another might sense light and bending. And they all communicate with the central brain, the central hub, and this base station is the brain right here. And it also operates as a charging dock, so you can plug these things right in to charge. Um, but in any case, um, yes. because all of these things work together, um, it's capable of adapting to your unique tasks and challenges for your project. Um, so you can incorporate uh, virtually any number of sensing modalities uh, you know, into your work and make your software and hardware responsive uh, to your physical world. So it's yet another uh, exciting way to control the digital world around you. It's brilliant. And yeah. or go ahead, Ben. Oh no, I'm just uh, interrupting. Um, yeah, no, it seems absolutely brilliant. So. Uh, all of these demo videos have just great ways of using it, whether it's the lighting or for uh, just coming up with different effect uh, integration, like adding reverb or delay. Um, with that in mind, uh, you know, are there any things that spring to mind that are just going to uh, be impossible to do with you know, <laughs> eight or nine of these <laughs> together and swarming over an individual? <laughs> yeah. Well, we we you know we we can't uh, you know cure leukemia or cancer with sure. the, with these sure. things, but um, but as far as performance technologies go, uh, there's something really profound uh, because you know we're in this era of so-called wearable technologies, mm -hmm. and uh, I like to use the Batman metaphor because uh, I'm a big Batman fan, and he is sort of been my model uh, for my work. <laughs> Uh, in this in this vein, and so you know, Batman's alter ego is Bruce Wayne, right? And you know, he's uh, a very talented guy. Um, you know, he's a trained martial artist. He kind of gone through the school of hard knocks. Both of his parents were killed, and you know, all, you know, all really so. But um, in order to you know fight crime, in order to do the things he needed to do, he had to become something greater than himself. And uh, uh, not that he wasn't already great. Um, but it was through attaching all of these gizmos onto him, all of these wearable technologies, that uh, he was able to gain superhuman capacities. And so what I'm really looking forward to here, what's very exciting uh, as far as emergence application to musical performance, is essentially you know creating superheroes. I mean, um, it, I was uh, I don't know if we'll talk about this a little later, but I was presenting immersion at the Margaret Guthman uh, Musical Instrument Competition at Georgia Tech. Uh, it was a uh, 22 finalists selected out of an international pool of applicants, and it's essentially kind of the Olympics of uh, you know what it is we're doing in electronic music world, uh, and um, uh, and and. 
what I was able to quickly do is they had these lighting systems there uh, developed by, I think, like ELM uh, ELM video. But anyways, they had this very sweet lighting system. And right out of the box, I was controlling, you know, these large arrays of lights all around me. And uh, I didn't have to. Oh, did, did I get lost? Um, no. no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, just controlling these massive lighting arrays and um, just instantly. And I felt just electrified, you know, and, and yeah, I, I later on went back to my studio to give this like kind of a, yeah, a victory lap run through just cause I, you know, just am always practicing. And, um, it, I kind of felt, you know, like, Oh, you know, just not having these, you know, the, all those lights. So it, I mean, it's a really amazing feeling when, um, uh, and, uh, it's not conscious, you know, I'm not trying to give the musician extra stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, to have to focus on. But there's something really exhilarating about just using your normal performance gestures and all of a sudden the lights and your effects processing and all of your hardware is just, you know, just becomes intelligent to you, just becomes aware or extra aware of of your motions and, um, you know, just not having to be tied down to uh, a foot pedal, you know, and like having to tap dance on stage or, sure. you know, having someone at front of house, like, you know, uh, monkeying faders around, you know, that these things can all be visceral, uh, and integral to your musical performance. And I think that is uh, really exciting. Yeah. Now, one of the main trends that I've noticed a lot at conferences has been for things like, uh, color tracking through video cameras or for using Microsoft's Kinect yeah. to uh, track gestures. Um, how does the immersion compare in terms of those in accuracy and uh, resolution in addition to being able to do everything just using your normal performance gestures? Uh, what's, what's really the killer well, edge imagine. that it has? Yeah, yeah. I mean, imagine, you know, if Batman only had his superpowers if he was within range of a camera. <laughs> but yes. uh, I mean, so so the immersion sensors, because you attach them onto your instruments or body, they move with you and you're not, you know, confined to a, a small place. Um, also, uh, you know, I think immersion and connect and, you know, things like leap motion are attacking, you know, these these similar issues or addressing these similar issues, but uh, on different sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. So um, there's something elegant with, uh, you know, leap motion and connect about uh, just sort of playing with things in air. But you only you have a very limited space, a limited window in which to do this. Um, also, uh, try to squeeze a ball in front of a connect and see if the connect can tell you <laughs> like, how hard you're squeezing it, right? Or turn uh, or, around. Right? Or you know, <laughs> turn around, right? Or you know, have your instrument or have your dog like walk in front of you while you're you know dancing. Um, I own a connect and I love these dancing games with it, but my dog like is always jumping up on me and ruining my score. Um, <laughs> but in any case. Um, uh, you know, the wearable technologies, the immersion system in particular, um, you're not confined to the space. Um, also, because they're attached directly onto you or your instrument, um, they can sense uh, how hard something is being squeezed. Um, you can uh, attach a, an accelerate with a bend sensor to your elbow and, you know, like very, get, get just very sensitive, uh, you know, data as far as, uh, you know, the nuance of bending. So I'm actually working with attaching one of these to a dancer, uh, right now and, uh, it's going very well. So, um, yeah, so it's, uh, it, thank you for bringing that up because it is very different from camera tracking technologies and, you know, there's all kinds of ways to, uh, you know, get to a certain um, uh, data tracking goal. And I think this one is just very elegant because there's no programming involved. Uh, there's no extra coding. There's no soldering. You just very simply, you know, get one of these uh, emotes and attach them, you know, onto the thing you want based on what kind of sensor you want to use, turn it on, and bam, uh, it goes into the software and you map it to... The thing you want to control. Uh, it's, so it's a uh, yeah. It's very uh, it, it's very easy. <laughs> yeah. 
that that removing the barriers of entry to this kind of physical computing is really awesome and it's a, yeah. it's a wonderful thank wonderful you thing. yeah yeah i was um the how i came up with the idea is i was uh, sitting at a coffee house and uh wanting to you know I, I was trying to figure out what to do for my dissertation and i wanted to make something kind of like nicholas collins uh, trombone propelled electronics or something like gordon muma with a cybersonic horn and um, this was several years back, I think four or five years ago, and I had no experience with engineering or sensors or microprocessors. And um, I, 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 was, I was like, well, you know, at this day and age, you can learn anything. So I sat down in front of Google, you know, and I was like sitting. I remember looking at this blank search screen and um, this cursor just kind of like blinking at me. <laughs> and I did. I recall like not even knowing enough to what to search for. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, like I had no idea. And so I very masochistically signed up for three years of electrical engineering courses at the <laughs> University of wow. Oregon. I mean, University of Florida, sorry. And um, uh, it, three years later, I was able to, you know, design even my own circuit boards. And I set to work on my trombone. And that's when I thought to myself, you know, well, this limits this this learning curve severely limits the amount of people in our electronic music community uh, to do this kind of these kinds of amazing things. Um, so uh, why not make a system that could very quickly just allow any electronic musician, artist, dancer, uh, hobbyist, scientist uh, to just employ wireless sensing in their projects w without having to learn all of that. I mean, imagine having to build a toaster uh, every time you wanted to toast a piece of bread in the morning, you know? And, right. you know, this is what all musicians are having to do with Arduino and uh, other other products out there um, just to get a wireless sensor stream, make something responsive to your movement. Um, it's, yeah, kind of a crazy world out there, the Wild West. So Exactly. Yeah, you know, kind of hoping to hoping to build a freeway to uh, <laughs> to your goals. <laughs> well, wonderful. Yeah, and yeah. hopefully uh, your project will uh, maybe even raise the standard of ease of use and standardization of these kind of things. Like um, you say that you use open sound control as a way of communicating between any kind of software you want, almost. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, I was curious. Uh, you said that uh, you're able to use. Uh, or use this technology to control lights as well using DMX. Does mm -hmm. that take extra hardware, or how how does that connection happen? Yeah, so um, that is a uh, what I the software does out of the box is it converts your gesture streams, uh, your 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 sensor streams uh, into the DMX protocol, uh, and then after that you're going to need a, a DMX interface and. I use one uh, that's called the DMX USB Pro, and um, that is a uh, that that's a really uh, useful USB to DMX interface. And so that data goes right into the DMX interface, and then it goes out of those um, those cables. And some people think they're XLR cables. Um, they're, they're you know DMX. They're, they look like uh, XLR cables, and they plug yeah, right into your so lights. <laughs> Yeah, so you know you're going to need um, you know anyone who wants to use immersion with DMX lights, they're going to need you know DMX lights and right. uh, <laughs> uh, to to get that DMX data out. But you know the the great thing is um, is that there's no extra programming involved. You just use the DMX emotion module, so the software module, and uh, it just translates it right into your system. Mm -hmm. And. Uh for any of those people who have taken that leap and gotten into Arduino and are able to uh, <laughs> talk with either uh, AC or DC lights uh, using their Arduino, this open mm -hmm. sound control would be a good protocol for connecting your work to the whatever they might have built already, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, at the Margaret Guthman uh, competition, I was uh, controlling two DMX lights on the floor um, uh, using my DMX stuff, but uh, they already had a DMX system, a house system, 
And so I was actually beaming my data wirelessly using the open sound control emotion modules and um, uh, to their house system. And so it was a uh, very, I mean, just basically instantaneously, um, they were able to map those open sound control messages right into their DMX interface. Um, nice. Coincidentally, they were also using DMX USB Pro for their uh, for their system as well. Even better. Yeah. Nice. Um, now, we've got it. Um, I was going to say we should probably move on and talk about the uh, Guthman competition a little bit. Sure. Yes. But I do have one question reading your Kickstarter. Um, why is GarageBand not supported? <laughs> well, you, know, I, uh, you have this wonderful list of uh, software and hardware, and GarageBand is the only exception. Well, I was looking at the MIDI mapping features, and I don't believe GarageBand has any MIDI mapping features, and that's how uh, one can very quickly communicate to Pro Tools, but you can always use the Emersion Switchblade hack, which okay. I, I don't know if I should really call it a hack, but just use the Emersion Switchblade, and so if you have you know, like a, a fader or something mapped to a key, like if you know your keyboard shortcuts to control GarageBand, uh, you can use Switchblade to, you know, puppet string GarageBand while you're playing. So, sure, why not? Uh, and that, why is, not? that is quite yeah. a Switchblade, a yeah, Swiss Army <laughs> knife of the computer music. It is. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right, everybody, you heard it here first. You can use it to control GarageBand. You just <laughs> might have to run it through a, ma a max patch to convert it into MIDI data first. Or I, I have one quick question, question before we move on. We, we uh, do I know, I know I'm not really the main person on the show, but I do, are there any videos of like an actual performance? The demos are really cool, but I, I feel like every time I see a cool new piece of gear or whatever it is, I don't ever see anything past the demo. And I would really love to see, because it's a really cool thing, and I would love to see a work that is made around this little piece of gear. Oh, most assuredly. Um, we had a, so I, com I competed on the first day of the Margaret Gunthman competition, and then we made it uh, into the top eight finalists. And um, so while I had to, uh, um, well, I got to go to Florida for my sister's wedding. Uh, she's 10 years younger than me. Uh, just a gorgeous, gorgeous wedding, gorgeous bride. Uh, but in the finals, my uh, colleague, John Bologna, he's from Georgia Tech, uh, he performed just a fantastic piece um, in the finals, and they video recorded that. And um, it, it's uh, so we're going to have that up online. Um, I also have a um, it, the sound quality isn't all that great, but I have uh, my Fantasia for uh, immersion enchanted trombone um <laughs> up on youtube as well so uh, i didn't post that on our on our projects just because the sound quality wasn't wasn't all that great you know there's a kind of a filter that i want to you know make sure we're only putting you know the the highest um uh what is it the the highest rendered media um and forward uh but in any case um yeah there's there's going to be some full length pieces. You know, we actually hope that people who are using the Emergent system uh, submit these things to us, uh, submit their performances to us, because uh, it's our aim to feature, you know, kind of a made with Emergent uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of area on our site. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I'd, I'd like to talk more about that uh, later in terms of like making pieces with this kind of technology. But maybe, yeah, we, you've mentioned a couple times this competition. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Who was Margaret Guthman and why does she have a competition? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, you know, Margaret Guthman is uh, just a sweet, sweet lady. And um, I, I believe it used to be a piano competition. Now, don't quote me, but it used to be a different kind of musical competition that Margaret Guthman uh, uh, supported or, or rather hosted, facilitated, and um, uh, they eventually moved it into an electronic musical instrument competition. And uh, and Margaret uh, attends uh, just about all of the events there. Uh, she takes really good cares of us, uh, buys us you know um, good catering, uh, <laughs> so there's you know good food. Um, and yeah, as far as competitions and festivals go, this was. Uh, by far one of the best uh, uh, run uh, and the best paced uh, competitions and festival that, I, that I've been to. Just very comfortable. 
um, a very, uh, very on time, everything running like clockwork. Um, and Wait, uh, it's a competition and everything runs on time. That's, yes. that's, that's <laughs> electronic music, too. This is oh, possible. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like herding cats, but um, I, I forget her name. They they had the sweetest lady um, uh, on the at the front row, and her job was just to keep time. And uh, <laughs> she had the nicest way of cutting people off. Basically, she would just like stand up and. <laughs> you know, just, you know, that would make everyone applaud and um and you know that was like a nice way to say okay you're 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 done <laughs> and that's amazing uh, because that was the that was the understanding up front and uh i think everyone respected uh you know moving along at a, a very um metered pace and it was just beautiful um it was also really humbling being with uh all of these really impressive technologies uh, from all over the world and just some fantastic performers, uh, very innovative um, uh, instruments. And the judges, I mean, you know, uh, David Ziccarelli, uh, you know, uh, the CEO and co-founder of of, uh, Cycling 74, uh, who is, you know, we all stand on giant shoulders and very rarely do you get to meet, you know, one of the giants that, uh, that, you know, basically facilitate your work. Uh, you know, they shape your work. And, uh, so it was really cool. Um, and then there was also young guru who is, uh, a producer for Jay-Z. And I think he, he told me he also works with Beyonce occasionally. Um, so, you know, big name, uh, folks. And, uh, the third judge was Chris Moore, who is a professor at Georgia tech. Um, yeah, but I mean, really fantastic, uh, things that I believe if you go onto their website or just Google Margaret Guthman competition 2014 um, uh, the finalists are all, all very good they're all posted um, yeah you're seeing um, uh, I, I I don't remember how to pronounce his name but Togan uh, uh, Kol- <laughs> Kogulu uh, and his microtonal guitar and uh, just very very nuanced uh, fantastic performer I mean his fingers are on fire you know and uh uh, it is so great to watch him watch him play. Um, ironically, uh, you know, because you think new instrument competition that, that you know where everyone's really like hot rodding these new electronics, and um, the the microtonal guitar was all mechanically uh, engineered. Uh, there were there were no electronics involved uh, whatsoever on the instrument. It was um, basically grooves. That he cut into the fretboard, and then you could place these little metal, extra metal pieces into the fretboard to give you these microtonal um, uh, inflections. So, uh, in in one moment, you could play a piece by uh, you know Harry Parch, you know, and uh, get yeah. your fifty two or whatever, 54 or whatever, incre- like microtonal increments. Yeah. Or you know, you could you know then turn around immediately and play you know some Smoke on the Water or whatever so it's a <laughs> it was a pretty uh it was a very innovative um and no no electronics um and then uh you know second place was a swedish company teenage engineering and they had this yes. great synthesizer yes. uh a radio a live radio sampler so you know kind of a, a an homage to john cage yeah, sort of in the version of their op1 synthesizer I believe so. Yes, okay. it is. Um, and uh, it was just uh, they get some of these artifacts in there that just really, you know, make it a rich sort of sound um, that you just can't emulate. And um, the, one, a young guru actually uh, um, sort of asked about that. Um, and, you know, they're just like, you know, something in the circumstances of the DSP or the electronics, but it's that sort of like a secret sauce, you know, gives it an interesting <laughs> sound, you know. Um, and then there was, uh, of course, like Fang Gao with his uh, trio, and uh, that was just a very uh, nuanced and interesting um, triangle sampler. Uh, basically, it had like three spinning, um, 
uh, pegs and a uh, maybe a blue rubber band of some sort. But as the, the thing spun, it would make the triangle, you know, like kind of expand and contract. And he could map the area of the triangle and the angles to um, uh, various synthesizer uh, parameters. So, you know, the area might affect you know, timbre, and then some of the other angles might affect, you know, the steps in a sequencer. Uh, so that was, um, it is a very interesting thing to watch. Yeah, yeah. But overall, just uh, just fantastic performers, uh, some really great, great things out there. Um, if you go onto the website, check out all the semifinalist web pages, uh, you'll see just some, some weird and wonderful and this innovative. really cool. Yeah, that's the yeah. triangle, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, uh, yeah, I encourage every everyone to log on to the semifinalist uh, listing and uh, just check out some of these uh, instruments because they truly are, you know, the bleeding edge of uh, musical instrument design. And uh, it's really fascinating to see where we're headed. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <Such> a... <laughs> that is such a great demo video, too. Um, yeah, totally. yeah, it's very encouraging to see that there are so many new products, both in the electric and in the acoustic world, coming out of this competition. Um, I mean, I do a lot of stuff with microtonal music, and I've seen custom-made microtonal guitars before, but yeah, just having the ability to quickly change between the scales is not something you normally see. Right. Or if you do, it costs... Oh, yeah insane amounts of money doesn't ever fret properly and you know uses rare earth magnets <laughs> right right something yeah and there's like no moving frets basically you just um you know uh during during rehearsal you just sort of uh pound them into place you know and then they they just um are on the fretboard ready for you to use and um um, there's no retuning or anything. Uh, so it's a very, um, it's sort of like, why didn't I think of that? You know, yeah. ideas, it's, uh, like the doorstop, you know, it's, yeah. it's like, <laughs> wow, you know, it's just, yeah, elegant and, and yeah, it's, it's pretty great. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, and yeah, congratulations. So, or, yeah. And congratulations. Uh, with thank your you. emotion going this far as well. Thank you very much. We're really pleased to be included with uh, the top eight finalists, and they were all just really amazing. It was, uh, it was great to be hanging out with all of them. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. Uh, what next? I, uh, well, well um, I guess shifting gears a little bit, we, uh, I, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about some of the pieces that you've made um, yeah. and kind of like you mentioned a couple things through through the podcast so far one of them was practicing which to me is a really interesting thing that um my personally like i've spent a lot of time with computers i've spent my time learning c++ and java and arduino and all these uh, and pure data and max msp and all this stuff and i've spent so much time learning how to like teaching myself and learning from other people about how to build things and how to learn how to use these tools and do different things. And I feel like if I spent half, half the time that I spend learning how to do things, actually practicing using the things that I've built, mm -hmm. probably make some interesting things. I, I, I was wondering, like, so are you able to like, spend time practicing, performing with the things that you've built? Is that a part of what you, like, how you spend your day? Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. I mean, um, you know, uh, Mark Applebaum from Stanford uh, has uh, an essay out on this kind of, you know, era where we're all sort of building our own, rolling our own musical instruments. And uh, he mentioned something about the mouse trap. And uh, uh, he said, uh, which is this hyper complex, you know, you guys familiar with the game mouse trap? Yeah. Because you know, it's you create like this maze of obstacles and um, and you know very intricate musical instrument and he says something to the effect of uh, I had immediate joy uh, knowing that I was the best performer in the world at this instrument uh, and then the second thought hit him almost immediately saying uh, I then I really quickly came to realize I was also the worst performer at this <laughs> in the world <laughs> and um, <laughs> it, you know because there's no culture 
natural um, uh, metric by which to judge. I, I feel, you know, how good or bad someone is at, at a home rolled instrument. Um, and it's sort of like, you know, made people in the uh, human computer interface, the HCI community, just kind of like, you know, crazy just because we, we, how do you evaluate this stuff? And I, I think it does need to be personal. Um, I think you need to be your own, your own metric because um, when you sit down with your in- instruments, uh, you can very quickly, um, or, or if you're a sensitive musician, you can ascertain um, and sort of self-assess uh, how well you did this, uh, how well you performed. And one performance, you know, when you perform a piece with your built instruments, um, you uh, it, um, over and over again. That is when you perform over and over, you get a sense for uh, I liked this performance a lot better than you know the last one, and you can feel like you're getting better each time. Or if you like mess up, like you can you can definitely feel you know feel that. So I think you need to develop your own practice with these with these things. Um, it, it's kind of a, a complex subject, really. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, as in all things, you know, practice makes perfect. And I think that um, having your hands on the actual uh, performance side of building these devices, it really informs um, how it really informs your practice as an engineer as well and as a programmer because uh, you understand intimately the needs of your performers. Mm -hmm. Uh, You you understand, you know, um, what's going on in the heat of the moment on stage. And uh, what has to work and how it needs to work. And um, so you, uh, I think it makes you a more informed uh, engineer and programmer at the same time. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, cross um, or a, a feedback. It's a very interesting feedback loop. Yeah, learning how to build things. So Dave has uh, switched over the video to our chat. And I was just going to say... Ustreamer481929 made a very good point. <laughs> Claire Rockmore had, uh, was a virtuoso uh, theremin player. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, uh, and if, if only each of these instruments that we build could have a performer like that, right? And we, yeah. we might try to be that virtuoso player ourselves. But this, to me, is something that, I, Chet, I think your, your endeavor of trying to make something that lower... Or, drops the barriers for people getting into this physical computing, maybe we'll start to have people like that, where they don't spend all their time coding. They just are able to get to using the thing, learning how the interface works really quickly. And maybe we'll be able to get some, some people really digging into this stuff. We just lost uh, two-thirds of our call. Uh, I think it's of no coincidence that the theremin was extremely and still is extremely difficult to play. <laughs> and um, I, I remember, you know, at the very beginning, Ben was talking about uh, what you, you pre-ordered a, a theremin that um, I did. has pitch auto tuner. Yes, um, and if you go online and you yeah. read the reviews for the Moog theremin on like Theremin World or some of the other theremin sites, uh-huh. it is the most drawn out awful flame war you'll ever see. I mean, yeah. in years really of good. reading SEI and Seamus comments or even YouTube comments. I've <laughs> never seen some that are as violent as this. I imagine <laughs> that people are in an uproar about this and it's because, you know, we are, we are continually as, as engineers and uh, you have to put on an engineer hat versus a musician hat. And as engineers, you, you want to design a system that's accessible um, and that's, you know, very uh, easy to use. At the same time, um, you gain and lose. There's a law of conservation of energy uh, yes, with yes. these things. And in all things that you gain, you lose something. Um, and so, uh, you know, in other words, the auto-tune bit, you know, like now anyone can be great. at, <laughs> But um, you're not going to get a Clara Rockmore um uh, right. Out of this auto tuned, uh, um, uh, I don't. I don't think he will. Um, uh, there's um, there's a danger. I think that needs to be designed um, right. into these instruments. There's something. Um, there's something uh, exhilarating about watching someone tightrope walk across Niagara Falls. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, At the same time, though. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny you say that. At the same time, though. 
everyone who starts playing violin starts off with tapes on the neck of the instrument to show where their fingers go. And you always have to have some sort of easy and accessible entry point for people to get into whatever the instrument or technology they're doing. I mean, you you have that and then you take the training wheels off eventually and then let them either, uh, you know, go down the BMX trail and uh-huh. do all the jumps or face plant. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. And there would be a lot. Yeah. A lot less, you know, acrobatic people out, you know, so the, we wouldn't have any Cirque du Soleil folks out there if, like, you had to start, you know, at that level, you know? I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. I agree 100%. Yeah, and I, so, yeah, that, and that's, uh, you make a really, really good point of not losing the fidelity, then. Mm. Not losing that, like, <laughs> the the expressive qualities that these instruments might be able to have. Yeah, so, like, Putting auto tune on a theremin, the pitch control isn't quite the same. Like right. we can't can't have the finesse and the specific kind of vibrato. Yeah. Or like the scoops or like just the different kinds of articulation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, imagine you know moving all the keys off of the piano that isn't in C major, and then sit, tell someone to go be Beethoven. You know. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so I that to me is the. Um, like, yeah, lowering the barrier of entry to yeah. to computer music is something that's really like a strength of what you're doing, which is exciting to see. Thanks. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so I guess we're running fairly long. I had one yeah. last thing I kind of wanted to touch on. Um, sure. And this is a, a past project of yours that's, uh, it seems like <laughs> it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah, but it's I, so I've, cool that we have to mention it nonetheless. Yeah, I, I, I've seen, uh, so it's it's an installation. There's no like, uh, uh, yeah, so it's it's an art, inst- or it's, it seems like it's an art installation with really custom electronics. There's acoustic elements and electronic elements and a speaker with water in it <laughs> and all, all these things. And like, it looks like it's a mess. Yeah, (laughs) both in terms of setting up and literally like spraying things (laughs) (laughs) which looks amazing could you tell us a little bit about this project it i think it's called hydra yeah yeah so um this project you know the um the reason why i got a little bit into robotics is that um, so much of, of what we do as, you know, electronic artists, electronic instrument, you know, musicians is just getting data from our physical world into the computer. And it's a very one way kind of relationship. And wouldn't it be exciting if the realm of computing could interact with our physical world, you know, like move things and, and you know, do things. And right, right. Um, so that's what got me into robotics. And I made this uh, guitar robot, and um, uh, this is uh, based off of, uh, there's a, a guy, um, jazz guitarist, Pat Metheny. Right. Uh, he right. he oh, does yeah. this orchestrion project, and uh, one of his many, many robots, uh, I think it's like developed by the League of Autonomous Robots, Musicians or something, uh, has a guitar bot. And so I was like, that is really cool. I'm going to build a guitar bot. And, <laughs> but you know, instead of having it puppet stringed by MIDI and, you know, having it play like pre-composed MIDI things or listening to someone else's MIDI performance and, pl- and accompanying them, I'm going to make this guitar bot compose its own music uh, from scratch. You know, no yeah. preconceived notes, no preconceived rhythms. Um, just rules. And uh, so I gravitated towards counterpoint, which basically, you know, is one of the oldest, you know, ways of, you know, uh, Western tonal systems that we have for putting one note against another and making harmonies and (laughs) uh, musical phrases. So I uh, distilled the rules of uh, basically 16th century counterpoint. Sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna try to play a little bit of the audio, but it was too too competitive with the talk. Okay. It's still going for us as well. Oh, is it? I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. It's not going into the program. I forgot you guys are on a submix. Yeah, yeah. So 
that's what it sounds like. And um, the intonation needs needs a little bit of adjusting. Um, but by and large, you have this uh, musically autonomous robot composing music in real time, playing it on machine uh, guitar strings, um, you know, with little belts driving or a motor driving a belt up and down a guitar string to, to choose the guitar note, um, capable of glissando and all that. Uh, and, but it's based on 16th century musical practice. Um, and then the speaker you're seeing there uh, yeah. is a uh, subwoofer uh, made by Paul Pino. And uh, he's currently uh, working up in New York City now. He was a student at um, University of Florida at the time. And uh, we created a, a non-Newtonian uh, fluid-driven uh, speaker. so Or speaker-driven fluid, rather. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, uh, basically, when the speaker vibrates, you can uh, YouTube uh, this and and basically it's just water and cornstarch, and there's something yeah. magical that happens when you mix water and cornstarch to the right consistency. Um, that when you when you pound on it or the force, it actually pushes back like up on you. It, like so, it's like um, which makes it ideal for visualizing vibration. And so when you put this in a speaker, you get all of these nodal and antinodal patterns. Uh, based on the you know harmonics of the speaker cone uh, as it's vibrating, uh, and so um, it was a, a basically a visualizer, a sonic visualizer for the sound of the guitar strings. Um, so I'd, uh, we'd amplify the guitar strings, we transpose them down two octaves so that the subwoofer was really vibrating well, and uh, and then the fluid just kind of did the rest. It was kind of a ballet of of uh yeah fluid it's very cool <laughs> amazing um i noticed in yeah. that video you uh you mentioned a, a maybe a, a separate project or a part of this project but they used a camera to um and it was uh mm-hmm. taking the color of, of people's t-shirts <laughs> and using uh-huh. that to control the notes that were being selected by that's <laughs> correct yeah yeah so um i took the the word color very literally because color uh, also translates to mode in music, uh, i.e., key or a scale. And so, yeah, I um, my robot was sensing whether or not someone was standing in front of it, and then it would send a wireless message over to a computer uh, running Jitter that was uh, color tracking. Now there was no like hardline connection; it was just telling a computer wirelessly, "Hey, there's someone standing in front of me. Can you check and tell me what color shirt he's wearing or she's wearing?" <laughs> And so the computer checks and sees what color shirt they're wearing and sends a wireless message back over to the robot. And based on whether it's a red, green, or a blue shirt, uh, changes the mode that it is um, uh, generating music in. So um, I think one is just standard vanilla major. Um, The uh, next was like a Hungarian bar talk. And uh, another one was a pentatonic uh, scale. (laughs) Yeah. And so... It's it's wow. really cool, like, just seeing, uh, like, even just with this one project, the extent of all the different kinds of physical and electronic and acoustic and, <laughs> I guess, fluid mechanics, <laughs> like, <laughs> addressing all these different means of making art, all, like, and bringing it all together. And I so I can't wait to see what, like, what you and what other people do with the emotion technology. Great. Well, and, and yeah, and thank you so much for, uh, you know, mentioning, you know, emotion because, uh, this is our inaugural kickoff. Um, so we're looking to raise $7,500 on Kickstarter and we really need a community of people to get behind this and make this new technology a reality and, uh, adopt our system. And we're really looking forward to bringing this new, uh, this new tech to the world. Um, I guess, you know, there is a lot of people who may be watching this podcast who are familiar with Arduino, uh, already. And, uh, you know, the biggest question I get, uh, from, from, uh, my community is, you know, why not just pick up a $30 Arduino? And, um, my response to that is, uh, um, it, it doesn't stop with the Arduino purchase. So, um, right, right. you know, you're, you would actually have to purchase three 
Arduinos, one for the base station and one for each sensor. And then you also have the wireless transmitters. Uh, and those, are, those can be costly. Uh, and then just all the other you know, components and the 9-axis. The, uh, Our Twist has a 9-axis accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer all built in. And so it's this very powerful you know, orientation sensor. Um, so you know, the cost very quickly you know, adds up. And so we're actually making this, um, you know, very I- extremely accessible uh, with, you know, that. So, and uh, that's <laughs> not even to mention the software that you have. Right. So, yeah. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Cause yeah, you have to spend time learning to put it all together, debug. And then they yeah, the software is really amazing. It just, it does so much. And uh, there's a $50 gift level on our campaign and you don't need the immersion hardware to take advantage of our digital data workstation, you know, our, our personal DAW. Um, so you can, uh, if you have any controllers um, or anything in your programs like Max MSP, C Sound, Super Collider, or just a control surface like the Ableton Push, um, you can yeah. use our digital data workstation to um, very quickly manage and map all of these controller streams and, and their mappings to your software. So it's um, well, the DMX Lite controller uh, is you know just fantastic too. So um, right. yeah, or the Switchblade. I mean, shoot, have fun with. I mean, <laughs> right. You don't need exactly. the, the hardware to to take you know advantage of of uh, you know controlling video games with uh, you know your joystick or puppet stringing it with Max MSP. Um, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> there are 51 days left to go as of today yes. for Kickstarter. So if you have uh, time within those 51 days, I highly recommend checking it out and hopefully pledging lots and lots of money so that we can see this uh, become a reality because I want one. <laughs> <laughs> and I want one too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But <laughs> Nate, I believe it is time for a two minute challenge. That's right. <laughs> and I believe uh tag, you're it this month. <laughs> so this month I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best in these uh hundred and twenty seconds to describe synthesizer waveforms. And uh so this is obviously like you can make anything with these and it's a really big topic. So I'm just going to kind of talk about them and not exactly explain it, but here I go. So synthesizers, um, I, I grew up using this, uh, old analog synthesizer, sequential circuit profit 600, and it had a couple different waves. It could make, it could make a sawtooth. It could make a square. It could make a triangle. And, uh, these things, I, uh, each of these are different shapes for an oscillator. So I want to just kind of go through this motion for it. <laughs> Something that's waving back and forth. This is simple harmonic motion. It's, it's the simplest thing that you might be able to do. And um, what that sounds like is just a really pure, like, <laughs> There's my best sign tone for you. Um, as you add other sign tones on top of it, using what would be called additive synthesis, uh, the shape of that would get a little bit more complex. You'd... Uh, get a little bit of different shape to it. A sawtooth wave looks exactly like, like a saw. <laughs> I'm drawing it for those of you on this video podcast. And that is very rich in harmonics. It's got, um, it has all the, uh, it has all the different uh, harmonics in the harmonic series. Um, a, saw, a square wave is, takes like every other one of those. Um, my favorite example of this, and I'm, I'm going to do my best to link to this in the show notes, um, so using something like PD where you can draw a wave shape and hear what it sounds like. As it, immediately, if it, the further away you get from a sine wave, it starts to hear or sound like more things are going on. And that's because it's actually interrupting that, <laughs> that <laughs> sonic motion. Like a sawtooth, imagine hitting the air and then easing off, and then hitting the air, and then easing off, and, and a uh, square wave is like hit, hit, hit. Makes for very rich. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't quite get through. What I was hoping to describe, but there's a starting point. I'm gonna put something in the show notes later to uh, describe it a little bit more. But there's something with yeah. audio waveforms in the synthesizer context. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and keep in Sorry, mind that was rude uh, of me to, to yell yell a noise at you. 
Right. <laughs> well, it's keep in mind, you're doing this in two minutes. I mean, I've read any sure. numbers of uh, books that are 300 pages on just this topic. Right. There's, yeah, LFOs, MFM synthesis, all these things that you can do with uh, waveforms and, um, and oscillators. But in any case, uh, that's how we like to end our patch in podcast. And uh, so that r- brings us to the end of our show. Chet, again, thank you so much for joining us. It was a brilliant Well, thank you very much, guys. That was uh, fantastic, and I'm looking forward to catching up with you guys real soon. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, thanks again. Um, so this is our podcast, Patch In. It's available as video and audio podcast on soundnotion.tv slash pi. You can also subscribe to it in the iTunes store or, or and uh, listen to it on whatever different podcast app or application that you like. Um, you can support the show and all of our shows on the Sound Notion Network uh, through the Amazon affiliate link on the Sound Notion webpage. We also have a couple different ways that you can donate to our cause. And uh, yeah, check it all out at soundnotion.tv. Um, thanks again, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. <laughs>